second part of the Jewish revolt in Jerusalem is an unfortunate business indeed. We are at the year 67 AD. One by one, the Jewish towns of the Galilee were taken over by Rome, at a cost of much human life. Once the resistance in the Galilee was subdued, the fighting shifted south to the area of Jerusalem. I would like to add some extra background for the further understanding of the context of the Jewish revolt. As I said, in Rome, Emperor Nero was busy with the arts and his musical career. He was less effective as a ruler after the unfortunate death of his mother, the young and enchanting Agrafina, which he had executed back in 59 AD. Now, Rome had burnt three years earlier in 64 AD, and consequently new taxes were levied to rebuild the ruins. The resentment, as well as the increase in taxes, spilled over to Judea as well. People did not like that. Here one should ask, was there not to like? But such were people then. In order to shift blame from himself, for the fire, Nero had the audacity to blame the early Christians. This resulted in many of them being expelled from Rome. That did not add to Nero's popularity either. On June 68 AD, he was offered the dagger. It was an offer he could not refuse, and he passed away peacefully at his own hand, actually a close servant to be exact. Meanwhile, in Judea, in the summer of 68, Vespasian, who was then a general, was actively besieging Jerusalem. Now Nero died in June, and Vespasian realized it was going to be a long year his efforts to capture Jerusalem had been reduced by the weakness of the chain of command. Roman historians refer to that year as the year of the four emperors. By 69 AD, Vespasian was declared emperor of the Roman Empire. He had returned to Rome and Jerusalem was left on its own accord. But in Jerusalem that time, the last thing you could talk about was an accord. They were zealots from different fractions and from different areas of Judea, none of which seemed to agree with one another. In Jerusalem there were the Sadducee priests who were officially the ruling class. There was the Jewish court of sort of the internal government called the Sanhedrin, but the Sanhedrin in vain tried to manage affairs they were ineffective against the high emotional toll that the rebellion extracted. And as I said, there were several fractions of zealots. Now, in general, zealots were less of a compromising lot than your average person. They competed with each other on who would be less compromising against the Romans and against the Sadducees and against the other fractions. A subgroup from the Galilee were actually expelled from Jerusalem and ended up in Masada, of all places. We will revisit that group in a future chapter. One of the more sensible people at the time in Jerusalem was Rabbi John son of Zakkai, a leader, a politician, a rabbi. But even he was powerless against the militant fractions. He had been part of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish internal government. While Jerusalem was still under siege, it was forbidden to leave the city. Rabbi John had to be smuggled out of the walls in a coffin. He later was able to re-establish the Jewish internal governing body in the lowlands. That was a significant move. The establishment of the Sanhedrin in the 70s was a fundamental proof that essentially allowed an alternative to the chaotic period. The Sanhedrin proved to be a management background for the non-zealots. That same Sanhedrin was the one that was governing the Jewish affairs for the few hundred years that followed. Let's go back to Jerusalem for a while. In the summer of 70 AD, Jerusalem fell. The Roman general at the time was Titus, son of Vespasian. It was a very difficult time for the rebels. It is said that during that conquest, the temple caught fire and burnt to ashes. This marked the end of a historical period called the Second Temple Period. 
The fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple still dominates Jewish historical and religious memory. Many died defending Jerusalem. Many were taken to be sold as slaves in Rome. Our learned friend, Josephus Flavius, who had fallen captive during the early party of the revolt, was going back and forth from Rome to Jerusalem, recording the events. He had recorded all that had happened. He interviewed refugees, he interviewed escapees, talked to slaves who had gotten back from Jerusalem. He kept all the information on file. Many refugees who were sold into slavery in Rome ended up bought by Jewish community of Rome and set free. But the fall of the Jerusalem temple plagued everyone's memory. The disappointment, the guilt, the anger. How could God have forsaken his people, they must have thought. Pockets of rebels were still left in Judea. The rebels of Masada, for example, were still at large. But Titus had better things to do. He came back to Rome carrying the spoils from the Jewish temple. The victory ark he erected is still standing outside the Colosseum of today. The Colosseum itself was built with the spoils of that unfortunate war. It stands till this day. And the rebels of Masada, they were still there. They were still thinking they can survive and preparing for the next stage. We will have a separate chapter about Masada and the rebels, the best story of them all.